This episode was sponsored by NFT Ventures Miami. Join the NFTV mailing list for the sickest drops. Welcome back to Adventures in NFT. We're joined by Robeck, one of the original Curio Card artists. How's it going, Robeck? Hey, how's it going? Um, it's going great. Thanks. So it's 2021, and in the strangest turn of events that I've ever seen, uh, we're going to go back and talk about my failed startup for 20 at, from 2017, uh, because all of a sudden that is uh, very important, I guess. So in 2017, uh, my friend Travis and Rhett and I uh, worked together with our advisor, Rick and Ryan Singer, uh, to work on a new kind of trading card. They were digital collectibles, blockchain collectibles, we called them. And they were called Curio Cards, and they had a cute cartoon mascot. And I thought they were fun, and I like baseball cards, and I got some of the Topps cards the other day, and I don't know that I'm going to make money on them, but I bought some, and it was fun. And um, the same thing, Curio Cards, I hoped that people would buy them, and they'd be fun. And uh, so we just kind of put the project out there. So, uh, Robeck, uh, first of all, I mean, you had an experience on the, the web. You have a comic strip. You have a website. You have a presence, that kind of thing. Uh, how did you go from that uh, to finding Curio Cards? How did you discover the project? Uh, yeah. So, I mean, there, maybe you guys have heard of Twitter. Um, it's, a, it's this website that's like social networking. Um, one time they made this thing that was like really stupid where they took the uh, algorithm from it just being everything in order, like of what people posted to it being like this programmatically designed thing to get, garner your interest, which does work very, very well. Uh, but for some reason, I don't know what was going through my head at the time, like where my thought space was. I was like, this is the last straw. Twitter's done. I'm, and, and I came into Twitter saying, I don't understand the point of Twitter outside of like business announcements. So I don't understand why it was an emotional moment. That stirred me to discovering um, like StatusNet and GNU Social and like the federated like social networking stuff, distributed networks for like social networking where you would have these different nodes and stuff like that. And I've met a lot of really cool people there. And one of the people that I met that kind of guided me deeper into this world was his name's Moon. And he is, I know there's a lot of moons in the world of crypto. You can say everybody's a moon. This was like pre-moon. This was like back when the moon represented uh, something in the sky and not necessarily like, you know, shooting the moon. And he was like, hey, um, after we, we, we talked and worked on some like pet project stuff and um, he was like, hey, I discovered this stuff called Curio and like it's on Ethereum. It's like a super interesting concept of taking like trading cards to like the blockchain. And, you know, I'm one of these guys that did not do Bitcoin early because I saw it and I was like, this is cool. But, you know, like $7 too much for me, not going to do it. $200, you, you know the story. Everybody repeats it. So I, I uh, did Doge. I just like did the the what were they the roulettes or whatever they were the the like a, a um, faucet? faucets yeah the faucets i just did faucets and then i uh, forgot it and then i saved all the chain state um but i have never pulled it back up and it doesn't matter it, that's not i kind of just put aside crypto came back into it when moon showed me the stuff and it was kind of invigorated me in this way that was like super cool because I had been stuck being this weird collector type person forever, like with Magic the Gathering and baseball cards and, you know, the same story that you tell, I'm sure. Like, now, now you know, I did you know, that and all the time, first of all, like, I mean, we were told the stories of our parents and down in the basement, yeah. dad used to have They've a got this golden age. Book. Every amazing baseball card, every comic book, they had Superman number one and they put their coffee cups on top of it. You know, it's that every kind of story. So growing up, at least when I did, uh, we were all about bagging and boarding our comic books and putting oh, hell yeah. cards, protective things and little boxes and everywhere, cardboard boxes. And uh, all the cards survived. So I never made any money on this. I was supposed to sell mine to go to college or something. <laughs> But again, you keep you keep something for 20 years and you have such an attachment to it. Then you're just supposed to sell it for for money for, I don't know, some kind of education. I don't know. But uh, yeah, I never made any money off any of my uh, collections before. So uh, do you have the same experience uh, just collecting for fun eventually? I, it, it's tough, man. Like, I feel like I've had a bit of a back and forth. I have this weird way with like life has always brought me to cool forks. And I always take 
a fork that is kind of like middle ground in the cooler way, but that always leads to some thing where it falls apart later. So like with magic and comics and baseball cards, I actually did very well because for some reason I'm a kid at the forefront of that stuff. And like, I'm getting this stuff and playing and trading and like creating economies and getting in early on stuff like eBay. Like I'm like 10 years old, not, I shouldn't be doing like sales on eBay for like magic, but I am. And like, that stuff that happens and it's like super cool you see these different communities you see like these weird like trustless trade things that were terribly just full of 100 percent trust through forums where it's like i vouch for this dude and i'm like 12 and like oh well 14 people have replied to him saying they vouch for him you can trust that they're going to do it and you know what the amazing part is is nobody i never lost cards and i did hundreds of trades like people always fulfill their end of the bargain anyway that kind of like leads me to this point and sort of like moon's like this is super cool he's like i did a lot of this colored toys and stuff He was like i've been working on some stuff on ethereum too that this kind of meshes with and so uh it'd be really cool to just like check this out if you're interested in like collectibles so that's how i discovered hero it's a very long-winded uh route um and i yeah so you you found the project uh we had some ethereum vending ethereum vending machines back in the day uh, did you try it out? Did you send a couple bucks in, buy a card or two to see how it works? Well, yeah, I mean, I think, you know, early on is more just trying to understand how this stuff is displayed. Like my my real foray into like really digging deep into stuff outside of, I don't know, the culture. I don't know if the right word is, but like just like getting this stuff was going into the new social and like just interacting with people I would have never done otherwise. Like these, there's like all across the spectrum and scope and like different lifestyles like everybody has like their own opinions and they feel their own way but it's really cool to hear what everybody else has to say and yeah i don't know it kind of brought me over here and uh it i don't remember what the even the original question was at this point mainly just if you tried it out like the technical oh yeah yeah so moon tossed me a few of the first yeah yeah moon tossed me a few of the first three and the long-winded point point was that I was going to end up to is like okay so I finally was comfortable enough to just figure out how to like make a wallet and do all this stuff and then I did um and it was super easy and then I was 100% on board with like everything everything suddenly clicked it was like suddenly knowledge across the board because like looking at the stuff it doesn't make sense but you know, there's just something about that, like, first transaction, you know, so. And even for me, it was learning as well, because I wasn't really into Ethereum. And I had to try it to try out my own cards, I had to try it to see if I could see how the cards were listed and uh, to learn about problems we had, like, uh, in the my ether wallet, it wouldn't show yeah, tokens, yeah. right? You, there'd be no tokens at all. You'd be they it's ripped me off. Like they're lost. Yeah. Still like that. And what you have to do is you have to go in and add a custom token. It has to have a special address or something that. And then all of a sudden, it'll show you know C R O O one or whatever it is. And uh, so I like that part, getting to learn the system. And then uh, the best part always for me is just the basics of this system and, and that it works. Uh, that moon was able to send you a couple of cards and i don't know anything about yeah. it because i wasn't controlling 100%. all the cards and i didn't approve and i don't need to know and i don't need to cut and all these things it just happens without me fantastic like how neat that is and you know i, I was critical of ethereum and everything but vitalik made a thing that can host my baseball card so i was like that's that's pretty cool man like i mean you make this big fancy thing and I put baseball yeah, cards and, on it. And I'm like so. this weird like community vampire that comes in and sucks all the life out of everything. So like it was super cool like to just end up there. And I know Moon had been like involved pretty early, just like in the community and the general idea stuff. Um just like stuff, but like I I don't know. I I, I feel bad about it sometimes in hindsight because I'm not trying to be intentionally malicious and I don't think I come off that way, but like I super get into the stuff that I'm into. So it comes off as like, why is he always talking in this this particular space? So I'm I uh, yeah, I think I probably just showed up one day and just started spamming like random stuff. Um, but it was a it was on terms of endearment. Well, I don't think you were the reason that the project failed. So I wouldn't no, worry. I, about no, that. I don't think so. hundred uh, percent. How how did you go from being interested in the project, trying it out, your friend even sent you some trading cards, uh, to becoming an artist? Well, I mean, a lot of the stuff kind of clicked for me from I mean, not even just collectible stuff from back in the past, but if you're looking at like digital inventory management systems or like video games, like everybody always goes back to video games, but there's so many different models that can work it for video games that 
make assets worth more than what they are in, in a particular game. So like even just Steam's like collection library stuff where you have like stupid gems and other like trading cards in that, those could all be represented as like uh, on this stuff. So like not, I'm not saying anything profound or new. It just like using it and suddenly like, okay, well, you know, I, I don't know why I originally thought Bitcoin was cool because I, you know, was like, this is interesting, but I'm not old enough yet. I don't have enough life experience, whatever it was. Like sometimes like I, it's just, I don't have that kind of money even to even think about this, but small steps and progression through whether that like introduction of Bitcoin to Doge to like metaverse to whatever brings me into this broader ecosystem of different ideas. Um, well, yeah. I agree with you on inventory management systems. Uh, yeah, that was uh, the point. It's like basically, like yeah. you mentioned earlier with uh, magic cards and you were selling them on eBay. Uh, I, I had them, I collected them. I never really sold them, but a friend of mine had showed me that, um, you could go on Diablo three at the time and you could play the online. Excuse me. And uh, if you get a really big sword, you could sell the sword on eBay. Yeah. That was Diablo money. two. I think this like, Let's there's like sold sorry. gems and like other crazy end game stuff that were going for like, sorry, not to interrupt. You can continue. No, no, I'm right there with you. And uh, the thing for me that was incredible, and again, I'm kind of grinding away at the game and clicking and killing monsters and clicking and killing monsters. And um, at the at the end of it, you know, I get the big sword or whatever, and uh, I sold the sword for like 40 bucks, 60 bucks, enough to cover the cost of the yeah. game. Then I wrapped up the game and sold the game as a used game because I was very tired of clicking on monsters at that point. And um, I, I was just the neatest thing ever that I was able to sell this sword uh, for, for real money, not even digital money or Bitcoin or any kind of thing. It was real PayPal, eBay or whatever. And, um, and, and I got the money out of it. And the funniest thing about this, a little footnote, is uh, the person who, you know, and I don't, I don't think it's a secret or an evil thing or whatever, but the, the friend of mine who taught me to do this uh, was my pal, uh, or my friend, Jesse Powell uh, from Kraken. And that Jesse had this early experience in selling digital items on Diablo, as well as you. He was into magic cards, and I think he was selling those on the internet. And he had that problem that I think we've all had where you make a deal with somebody and it falls through. Uh, they run off with the money, or they claim you never sent it. And when he's the one selling the sword, he'd be the one with the empty bag, and the kid would run off with the yeah. sword. Maybe he gave it to it. And, I think know. it's I think it's so incredible because uh, like MMOs were this like really cool new thing and like Di Diablo 2 was more like lobby based you know like eight players whatever but you did have that like real world item like that item became like a token value that was traded at an exchange rate on eBay but what was really cool that can't, came out of that whole aspect is like okay suddenly you have two two different paths one mmos between diablo 2 and diablo 3 so you have like world of warcraft or ragnarok or whatever and you have people that farm their time in game basically is what you would equate to like mining in like any of these systems like their time in game they're spent farming an asset that then they they send sell for real world assets so they farm wow gold right so they farm gold they they sell it on ebay for like a percentage cost and they make the transaction in the game itself imagine if like blizzard just issued gold on on chain with like a royalty percentage or something so you know it's not a waste of time. like people farming this thing people want it it's not like a waste of things it won't diminish the value of x or y it diminishes the value of x or y when there's not anything at stake for these gold sellers like you can ban them forever but that doesn't create an economy so there's like i don't know man just all this stuff like whooshing together to create all these like well, and it's, potential it's opportunities interesting to see how how many of these pioneers were tied up with uh so what at the time a lot of us thought were just waste of time games yeah right like world of warcraft from the beginning i could see as a huge grinding trap whereas like i had already avoided star wars galaxies yeah. and i love star I was like, if Star Wars Galaxies is as good as they say, I'll never do anything in the real world again. So I just didn't play it. Now, it turned out it was a bad game, and I just avoided a bad game. But the idea of immersive Star Wars world, I could see already, was very addictive to my type of person. And I think that when World of Warcraft came along, lots of people uh, didn't avoid it. You know, they steered right towards it. And uh, one of them was Vitalik Buterin. 
And I don't remember what the detail was that pissed him off. They changed some spell. They rebalanced something. They fixed something in the game that messed up his character. Uh, but he quit World of Warcraft the next day. And that's what I think led him in many ways to like Bitcoin and cryptocurrency. And just like with my friend Jesse and Kraken, a lot of these ideas were just floating out there where he had the problem of people ripping him off for digital sorts. So when he heard, I don't know what the details, but I assume when he heard about Bitcoin, he was like, this is a product that can keep people from ripping me off for my digital swords. This is great. And for Vitalik, same thing. He's already out there in World of Warcraft, knowing all about digital swords and all the values of things and digital currencies while he earning uh, Warcraft gold, I'm sure. And uh, it was no big switch for him to see, hey, I would, I would love a gold we could move between system to system. What if I want to play another yeah. game? I could move my value around. I think, I think what's interesting even more so to go off the World of Warcraft thing is like after World of Warcraft, if you're looking at Implicit as a company and like games they're publishing, you know, I, th I think honestly the next game was probably like StarCraft 2 and then Diablo 3. And in Diablo 3, they introduced an actual in game market, a real world dollar market. Um, and, and I think Diablo 3 came out in 2012. And so, what that, so basically their intent was like, okay, well, instead of going through these like potentially malicious scenarios on eBay where you're trading these end game items, you can just do it through us as a trusted party where we take 1%, you know, of your, of, of the sale, but you guys get to keep all the rest of you actually get dollars out of it. And gamers at that time, it, it, like if you look at all the different trends in gaming, it was like pushback against like these con centralized control systems. You had like a thing shortly after where Bethesda wanted to start like um, monetizing mods mods through us and we'll take a small cut but they'll be official and like all this stuff so the diablo 3 thing was actually it was like it was before that but it was like met with or i don't remember exactly it was met with like all this vitriol it was like no you can't take a cut of this but if if they did literally the same thing today but you know just on blockchain like uh they would be met with roaring applause and because i think people are starting to get this idea like yeah, I don't know. The you know the idea, probably. The, the idea of moving the items around. Yeah. Like if we go to Diablo 4, if I could bring my custom sword with me. And even better, I've thought, is if I was a rival company to StarCraft and Diablo and Blizzard and whatever, and I could go in and make a game that would use that same NFT sword, and maybe it uses it to mine space or hack up demons or something completely different. Yeah. And if I'm, if my game is more popular and better and more fun and makes them more money or whatever the winning conditions are, maybe all of those swords get staked to my system. Maybe I yeah. take all of their NFT valuables and they have to go fix their game and make their game better. And now we're competing for a universe of free floating items that have their own value and that were maybe created by Blizzard. But now you play them in some other game, some other, some other, some other game, and they're traded and they're independent. Uh, so yeah, and, and like farming, yeah. like you could literally yield farm those items. So like, let's say it's one of the rarest drops in World of Warcraft. Well, if you put that up as collateral or you put that up into a liquidity pool in my game, which is coming out, you know, here, then we'll give you an item that is even better, like in our world. It's like the rarest and most rare things based on the number of like, yeah, I don't know loans or some other random stupid aspect the, against the sell it sell out their old game yeah. sell out your old game you don't need that sword sell yeah. it to us we'll give you stuff for the new game yeah and we'll pay you to stream it on twitch uh you know for a week you could embed that in the sword contracts and things like that like you get a deal to uh, yeah. stream for a week and there's a thousand unlock gold if the uh arbiters agree that you uh fulfilled your contract but I think we've drifted off into the future. We need to get back to the past. Sure. Uh, so, Roback, how did you become a Curio Card artist? Did you fill out a form? Did you get the inside track with Moon? I should probably know this, but I'm kind of asking you because I'm not sure I recall. No, I don't know. Uh, I mean, Moon Moon was doing tertiary stuff to what you guys are doing. Like, so he was building like his own binders and galleries, and like, want, he was trying to build like a broader, more expansive one that would collect multiple assets, not just curios. Curios were unique at the time because you guys were the only ones that were doing that specific thing. And so, like, how we were pulling cards, we actually started creating new things, like new art for other assets being represented on the network, like Bat and other stuff. So, 
no, it, I don't think it was through Moon. I think I just, I, I don't know, I just kept showing up. And then you guys open applications. And I wanted to do something like holographic something. Like, that was the big thing that I, I sent over. My original pitch was like 12 different like concept pieces. And what I was doing most of the time was doing like really rudimentary pixel stuff. Like I wasn't, I, I feel like right now I could do good pixel work if I wanted to. Back then it was just like me learning. What does this actually mean? What's the technique? All that stuff. But like with it, I could do really quick animations. And so like, I was like, well, you know, holographics were always a cool concept on, on collectible card game stuff. So like, what if we could animate one of these? And so I was like, hey, here's, here's how it would work. It was animated. You guys, that's way too many frames. We can't push that much data to the chain. Uh, but we could probably do two frames if you want to send two frames over. So like card number 23 is like the most, it's not animate. It's just literally a frame that like winks and like pulses. But that was the limitation of what I had. Anyway, I think that between the form, yeah, there was a form I submitted and you guys read through that stuff and then had a conversation with me. I think a lot of people have to gauge whether me sending like crudely drawn raccoons doing like meth and selling curio cards in alleys is like part of a like general act or persona or if that's me and that is actually me doing that but like if it's meant to be because i'm it it's not it's, it's all out of love so i think it's, it's clearly get there. qualifying i mean any kind yeah. of hand-drawn qualifying art uh, is exciting to us and everything. So yeah, I think you filled out the form. Uh, we checked out your web page. I remember, you know, it was like comic strips and other stuff. And the main thing we're looking at there is we're just like, is this the same person that made the art? Yeah. You know, are the angry, drunken, curio car, <laughs> angry drawings, the same person that makes this comic strip? And we're like, yes, they seem to be in line. And, and that's what I love so much about one of the other artists, Daniel Friedman, uh, who also, I think we just got through the form. Uh, I went out to his Flickr and he had just hundreds of these hand-drawn uh, line art with a pen, uh, where yeah. to me it looked like the kind of stuff I'd do when I was bored in class, except he was much better at it. Uh, but still, <laughs> you look at it right away and you're like, this is unique art. He's making this himself. Like this isn't, he's not copying this from anyone. It's not a Banksy trying to fool me. Um, so I like that aspect of it. But yeah, we brought you on and I love the animated card. I think it really is... Uh, it's worth it. It's the first animated card, just like the early um, movies and things like with a little stop motion and even um, like a Keystone Cops well, it cut out the frames and they would run it faster. So it looks funnier. Like uh, this is this is how things are done in the early days. And uh, I think you're definitely there for that. What about the idea? And how did you get the idea to draw the Curio card uh, creators? Did we tell you to do that? No, you didn't. So I and mean, this was actually where I was actually going to goodness. No, no, you didn't tell me. But this is actually kind of where I was going to segue anyway, is like from a perspective of like, where are we on the scale of like next gen new web? Like, like just like from gaming, because it's the easiest perspective. It's like, what generation? And it's like, okay, well, maybe we're in this like Atari NES at best things. So what kind of things can I do to like do, do this? And Gauntlet comes to mind as like this thing where it's like you speed tokens into the game and you have select identities, right? And it's based on common themes that we get to Tolkien. And so even if you don't even get references to games, like you still can get the fantasy stuff. And so the original pixel art I had sent over were actually, I think, way better just like from a technical craft perspective than the stuff I was doing in Krita. Because Krita is what it is. A, it's like an open source uh, painting program it's freaking sweet but it was like kind of newer at the time and i was testing it out but i yeah it, it just i don't know i wanted to pull that back into the actual project and what i was thinking of was like okay well you know you have these different tropes but what makes it unique what separates gauntlet from like lord of the rings from warhammer or whatever and it's just like i don't know some of its merchandising like if you think of he-man and like all the stupid stuff that like, why does he man even exist? It's like, well, because they're trying to sell stuff. So if we're doing this NFT or not, well, they weren't NFTs, but we're doing these collectible things. I mean, do a card, but this is the whole reason I made a commercial for it. Like I pulled elements, I pulled like clips from old commercials to, and then did my own VO over it and like did stuff. So it was very heavily attributed. I don't own most of the stuff, but like I did it because I wanted to push that like idea of like this is something you want to show off to your friends on the playground that your mom got you for you know christmas or your birthday and you got two of them not just not just the one you got the one in the hawaiian shirt variant like that i wanted the vibe that was what i wanted to portray not so much like a, a solid piece but 
we want to have the vibe with the original characters associated with the brand and it just made sense i think gauntlet is a great reference there and i remember back to first grade uh, we used to draw our own gauntlet maps and i didn't know anything nice. about video games and mods and how anything worked but we'd get paper out we'd be like monster here you know pit here and wall here yeah. you know that kind of thing and just uh, something about the game uh, not that it was like a bad game, but you look at it and I, I think I look at it and I was like, I could do this. I could draw a map. I could drive the characters around. This makes sense to me. And it wasn't, you know, like drawing a Mario map or something just so intricate. No. It was just a lot simpler. And you could even kind of play it out with your fingers, you know, because you didn't have a video game with you all the time back then. Uh, but yeah, yeah God, it was a great wild. reference. And, and also Lord of the Rings. And it fits in with the kind of the hero's journey and these three characters going on an adventure uh, of course, the first 10 cards uh, very much speak of adventure and kind of going from like youthful youthfulness to uh, adulthood, kind of starting out and learning the arts and then becoming an expert at the arts and then going out into the future, the number 10 card. Um, so then yeah, I mean, that, you guys just didn't have a healer. I mean, the bard could have done some supplementary healing, but yeah, unfortunately, yeah. We weren't going to make it very far without a healer. That's right. The yeah, quest, yeah, yeah. quest would fail. <laughs> uh, yeah, you need a cleric at some point hopefully you meet one along the way but it was interesting to see the way the cards went we did the kind of uh the early cards we tried to raise funds for the company and they were kind of clip arty by uh Phineep series and then we did i love them though the Phineep cards are so sweet like man i don't know it, that aesthetic is going to come back and play in like 13 years that's my call like the value of like the aesthetic that he pulled or they, I don't know. I don't mean to jump to conclusions, but like, I don't know. It's just very specifically now it's Curio. So, uh, well, we cool. might, after after we get to the the break, maybe we'll go back. We'll talk about the individual cards. Sure. And uh, I can even reveal some interesting stuff about like oh, choices that we snap. That might not, so. um, but yeah. So after the the one through ten, then um, it's the greatest thing to me because of course, remember, like I said here, I'm a big Bitcoin supporter, always been. And not a big Ethereum fan. So what do we do for our, our next 10 cards pretty much is uh, all Bitcoin stuff. We do the crypto graffiti uh, Bitcoin propaganda. We do Phineep uh, Bitcoin logos. And then we do crypto uh, crypto pop Luis. And he does uh, Bitcoin uh, cartoons. But uh, then we pop it off with a good old mad Bitcoins card. And um, and then we reach the Robeck cards. Uh, so we have their, your series there. fits in there. Well, I think I think. I think the 11 through 20s are funny because they're still some of the more popular cards. I know you said we can talk about the other cards later, but I think this is important to get into where it is. I think that at the time I was like, why the f are they like keep doing Bitcoin cards? Like, I don't give a shit. Like, like it does like, I get it. I get Bitcoin, but I don't give a shit. Like wh why we're on, we're doing this card thing. I don't know how this is going to draw people if everything is only a Bitcoin reference, but yeah, it's funny today. Like even those are still, some of the more popular cards there's just more of them but it's also good there's more of them because more people identify with with that like as their roots so i think a lot it's cool of that's, uh, due to how the cards got distributed as it turns out but uh, i think going back why did we do that i think these are the artists that we knew uh, yeah. in the bitcoin space we knew crypto graffiti from the meetups uh we knew Fanip from the internet he did the mad bitcoins things and then uh, my friend rick one of our advisors uh, knew luis so again, these personal relationships make a big difference. Everyone, uh, you know, is down on it or whatever, but you got to go out there and meet people and be part of the group. And then when they think of, hey, I got a project, they'll be like, think of you. And so then after that, we went to the internet. Uh, we brought in the Robeck cards. Um, <laughs> after those, um, let's see, what did we have? Oh, we had- um Can I can I say real quick though, like to interrupt that I, I am so highly appreciative that you guys did consider it and not from like not from like a here and now perspective but from at the time because there's a like like i was mentioning earlier there's a lot to cut through when you have to deal with me because i don't know like well it doesn't really matter why but like yeah i don't know it just gave me an opportunity to feel like it, okay so if these communities are really about what they're saying they're about like open participation and like honest you know like vetting and like other stuff like this is the real opportunity to shine. And I think you guys, if had it not been the way that it ended up, the, you guys were always transparent. Like I know that some other people may feel 
differently and there's a lot of stuff that happened while you were winding down but like i didn't get i wasn't like in an in circle i was watching and participating in the channels that you presented to the community and it was super cool that like i knew what was happening every step of the way you guys are going to release new cards on tuesday you're going to do this you're going to like yeah it was never unclear so uh, i yeah I, I appreciate the the well, I'm, Ouch. I'm, glad, I'm glad that you appreciate it and also i mean look at what you gave to us you made three unique pieces uh you know on our own we didn't pay you for those uh we didn't give you any of the cards because they were all in the vending machine you had to buy them and basically after one through ten card failed the idea of buying the artist cards and then selling them uh also failed because there's just simply no capital to buy the artist cards it was better to uh just have the open market do it and if people wanted them uh, they would use the vending machine and anyone it was open to anyone we announced it we had youtubes and twitters and tried to spread it as best we could uh, but then after that we did the uh, like i said the daniel friedman card the pen and ink art and uh, what's interesting is that for your cards you chose a low number and then daniel chose an even lower number and during your cards something different happened on our uh on our new card tuesday uh somebody came in and bought all the cards yeah and they're not back that's the weirdest part. Like, so at the time, I, I, uh, three Ethereum at the time is a lot for me. And that was back when Ether was like, or sorry, not three Ethereum. Oh, God. Three, three ETH is, was a lot. So that's back when Ether was like uh, 120 bucks or like 70 bucks. I can't remember exactly. There's different phases. It went, it just kind of skyrocketed to like $250 pretty quick. But like, you know, three is a lot. You know, I'm not, in, I'm not in the space yet. I'm still doing other stuff and like researching and it's kind of cool. I can play around and that's what got like have suddenly having ETH and like participating and let me see other projects that I could do stuff with. And like, it was super cool, but yeah, uh, I don't, but we uh, what, didn't know what was happening because at first, I mean, I was, oh, yeah, cause yeah, that was it. Always like, try to get some, some test cards. Cause I need to make sure the vending machine works. Right. So uh, cause I don't want people sending their money to a broken machine and I'm sure Rhett checked it, but if you're going to do a TV show or a YouTube show, even you got to check it. So I test the old machine. We're going along and then somebody just comes in, buys like hundreds of cards. And, uh, we were worried they were lost. Like maybe they thought it wasn't, <laughs> uh, because a lot of the ERC 20 tokens, which we were using to represent our digital collectibles and we didn't have the nft standards they do today and um you know we were worried people might be confused and think this was an ico yeah. company and this guy's sending his money for that and um no to this day oh we don't know who the the real giant whale on this is uh for a long time i thought it was our advisor rick i thought that um, i did yeah that he'd gotten the clue and he was like oh of course i should i should buy my you know friend's little project that sounds cute um you know throw some ethereum at it but it was a very specialized skill set you had to have this my ether wallet you had to have the ethereum in it you had to trust this vending machine concept of rets that you send money to it and you get back a curio card and as we said earlier if you didn't reconfigure your wallet to show those contract addresses you wouldn't even know that you got the tokens uh you yeah. just sitting there thinking you're ripped off uh so whoever did it took a big leap of faith and uh they started on your cards well i mean what was weird about it was at the time i was kind of disappointed that mine sold out so fast just because like you know i did the commercial stuff and i did other things but i'm not like a big person and i don't ever try to be like i'm not trying to be this this this, this person person on the internet but i was like is this somebody i know is just like a friend or a parent or like kind of coming to the same conclusions that you drew there but like i was like i don't know if it had come in a little bit more organic i think it would have been more meaningful or something like that but like i i always assumed that i would discover the identity because like the, the great the best part of all this tech is that it's super fully transparent and that like you can actually figure it out anytime like if i really wanted to dig i could find out who has what like it doesn't take that much to, to figure out but yeah no idea they like ghost they disappeared and like no no one ever reached out to me about it or anything so it's weird well and a similar thing i don't know if it was the same address or a new address or the same guy using different addresses uh but a similar thing happened on the daniel friedman cards their their supply was so low three 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 two 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 and of course one 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 uh that after a couple of test batches came out 
um, somebody came in and bought up all those cards. Um, not so much for the Marisol Vengas cards. I'm not sure what happened. It didn't continue. Those were also very low levels. I think they were like 300 or 500 a piece. Um, but it, it was a strange turn. Well, I have dark secrets to tell you. I mean, I didn't buy up a bunch of cards, but at the time I was testing out functionality in the network and stuff and like watching contracts and things like that. And like, I'm, I liked that Daniel was doing the different card pricing. So for like Daniel's first one, like, I don't know. I had ETH from the sales of mine. You guys sent me a little bit from, like it was at the same, at some point where you could get ETH out of one vending machine or something. So you sent me some and I was like, well, I want to participate. I want to see what's going on. Like, let's watch the sales. And so I don't know if it was this 26 or whatever, but there's one where I was like, okay, let's see how it goes for the first few minutes. But if it goes this way, like I want to, you know, put into Daniel's work and like, see how that goes. And so uh, I did. And so I have a handful of 26s, but you know what I realized is that there's an, that, I don't know if you're talking about the other, the same person, there's another whale and I don't know who that is. And it's like a lo- another significant sum of Daniel's cards. I don't have, any, I have very few 27s, 28s, 26s, like 25s. I don't have very many of my own. It's just a couple of cards I have a handful of because I was like, this would be interesting to try as like a market experiment. Like we had Ether, Del- Ether Delta at the time. Like, like that site didn't work at all. You had to manually input all the stupid shit and like it would break on most of the trades. Gas was like out the window. It was like four, bu- four bucks if you're thinking about dollars, but that's still point like zero one ETH. So like it's still unreasonable. So yeah. I don't know. I think it's Uh, fantastic that you reinvested into the cards and into the project. I think one of the nice things about your card selling out is that we were just able to pay you uh, for your card (laughs) eventually, because the problem with a lot of the others and the reason that people didn't get paid maybe, you know, for four years or something is because they never sold out. And we were waiting to see what would happen. And we, we hoped they would just sell out in a couple of weeks or a couple of months. And uh, it didn't happen. And it turns out it happened, you know, four years later and we're getting close to that. But um, um, no. So so what do you think after we did Daniel's cards? Uh, we did the Marisol Vengas cards. I think they're very nice looking. Well, I have to say Maris. Oh, not the Marisol one. Sorry. The Thoris and Mira ones made me very annoyed with you guys because she or he or whatever. They got like full animation. They, I mean, it was like compressed, hyper compressed because that's what the limitations are. But yeah they got like so much so many more frames so i was i felt burned by that one uh but i appreciated how nice it was it was like mwah. it was a nice like clean smooth thing to round out the whole batch um the marisol ones are are are, are fun i ended up with uh some 29s in my experience and uh it's just interesting to see the dynamic of how these things have grown in the present versus things that at the time it wasn't like Oh man, if I'm I, like, do, do you think that the first person who bought packs of gum with baseball cards in them were like, I'm going to buy all these packs of gum because they've got cards and no, there's n- absolutely no way people were like, this is a speculative asset that if I keep in my basement and sleeves for like 45 years, then people are going to really want these. There may be a Mickey Mantle in here. Like there's no way. So like, well, and I just, even, even the idea on how to collect them, is kind of foreign if you don't know. Like I started on the top baseball cards yesterday and it started out just like normal, right? You're getting packs and you're like, packs are pretty cool, but then the market opens up and they start listing individual cards. And you're like, ooh, I can just buy the guy I like. So I yeah. just buy an Oakland A's, right? Big green jerseys, that's my guys. And but now you gotta um, make up for that purchase. Oh, well, I'm not about making up, but I just think that, uh, you know, the thing works like the, the collecting, the idea of um, how do I decide what to collect? Well, I'm going to collect A's. It's a team. It's a subset of all baseball players. So this way, if I open a pack of bubblegum cars, I know that the A's are the good ones, right? I'm like, put those in my keeper pile. Um, even that idea. How do you come up with that? Maybe you're collecting the the ugly faces, maybe the pretty faces, maybe the, the ones that are close ups or far away. I don't even know how you decide uh, to even start collecting any of these things, let alone uh, why you wouldn't just throw them out with the uh, gum wrap. Like, just throw that gum in your mouth and get rid of this crap. Yeah, I mean, it, it makes you wonder, like, wh- I don't know, everybody has their own, like, 
psychology that brings them to particular places and like whether it's comfort or I don't know revenge or like I don't know what people are feeling when they collect stuff but whatever it is it's clearly a drive that 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 encompasses everyone and then you get into categorization and it's all wild but I don't know it just made sense to push forward in the ecosystem and see what people would do if you if they are cards sold out like what would they do if they're called cards sold out if they had a card that sold out and I don't know and I, what I did think they do they were, I think they were pretty thrilled I mean I've listened to Daniel's podcast he did with Adam McBride on the Adam McBride show and it's very cool and I hope to speak to Daniel uh, in the future here soon I haven't contacted him yet but I do want to and uh, like you said, after we did Daniel and Marisol Vengas cards, we did the Eclipse. And uh, I don't know how they did the animation. Uh, as an amateur, I can say it looks like a dithered gift to me. Yeah. I remember putting those sliders back in the day when uh, file size really mattered and you needed something small. Um, I do remember, though, there's something really nice about that card. There's only 826 of them made, and that's because it was 826 uh, 2017, which was the day of the Eclipse. And it was a huge uh, solar eclipse. I had those cool glasses that made it so you didn't go blind. And I went out on the roof and I watched it and it was really fun. And uh, it was kind of, we didn't know that we were ending the project. I mean, we knew we were- You guys we could have just- first 30, But it was kind of like a, a beautiful metaphor for, for Akira cards where it was an eclipse. It was a thing that was there and then it went away like the eclipse. And, and that was you know, kind of a beautiful poetic <laughs> ending to the project. I feel like there was- you just needed like three more months and i think i mean i'm not I, i'm not tooting my own horn because i'm not a smart person in like a lot of ways but i think that what the biggest faux pas i saw with curio and not that you asked my opinion but because i was invested in like the community that was built around it was like you guys were super keen on like what makes a good community right but towards the end like obviously you're trying to wind things up i don't know there's different reasons for it but like there were potential community paths forward where people were super eager to continue it, where it's just, it's not feasible to think about when you're in that moment. It's like, well, shit, well, I've got to wrap up the business stuff. Like how am I, like, I can't really deal with this side stuff. It totally makes sense. But it's like a couple more, couple or more months, I think you guys could have launched another set. Like you had already started, you, even after like the brief hiatus, could have gotten there, but I think it's just... I think it's better now in, in a way. Um, well, it's I, mean, just... I, I can speak, you know, for myself, uh, my plan as, you know, the mad Bitcoins guy, as the guy that edits videos and just puts them on YouTube and hopes someone's finds them. Uh, I always want to just keep cranking forward. And I kind of had my head down and I was, I don't really see the results of things. I just see like new card Tuesday. I was like me and Travis do new card Tuesday. Rhett makes the cards. You know, I email people, I get some images, I work New it all out. New Tuesday was good. It was easy, I thought it was, uh, but yeah, it, it was, was like, a, it was really good. Like after the first, the first two minutes of the first one, you're like, what? And then you're like, cool. New card Tuesday. I'm in, I'm in. Yeah, I'm, I'm yeah, on board. I wanted to keep going with it. Uh, I was told that writing the contracts was stressing Red out. Uh, so that's why we stopped doing the different price choices because that was a totally lot, understand that a lot more contracts for Rhett. And then we just keep looking for ways to like scale it back, make it easier because his time was so important. He's a very important. He's a programmer and all these things. And we're, you know, idiots talking about baseball cards. Uh, he just he didn't want to waste his time, didn't want to waste Travis's time. And, you know, maybe I wasn't the right one to be the business guy or whatever. I mean, I'm more of a marketing guy, I think. And um, so it just, you know, it kind of shifted. And internally, what we did is that I was, we were all equal, but I was kind of the CEO guy. And uh, we moved that to Travis and Travis became the CEO guy. And if you look at the record, Travis goes around and makes speeches at Ethereum conferences and meets with people and does all the kind of things that we hoped would work uh, to get us some funding to make us a company. Cause like, you know, rent had to be paid. The rest of us could have used health insurance. Uh, rent money was running out. Uh, you know, none of us were totally. infinitely wealthy, despite Bitcoin and all that, like in which, again, this is where the Bitcoin went, you know, is all this rent and these kind <laughs> of things. But um, so, yeah, it just it just wasn't working out. And uh, New Card Tuesday winded down and uh, the car, the Travis took the addresses off the Web pages because we didn't want people to buy the cards and to lose more money. Uh, we, you know, we felt bad for everyone that had bought our worthless cards and uh, so on and so forth. And it just kind of 
it just kind of drifted away. I, I think it, it didn't hurt anybody. Uh, you know, it used a little bit of people's times uh, and stuff like that and got some hopes up maybe. Uh, but Travis went on to learn how to be a computer programmer and got jobs doing that. Rhett went on to work on other projects that went. I'm seeing the epilogue now, like with the, even the music and everything. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I yeah. think it was, it was good. And, and, and we're still friends. I mean, I don't think anybody's mad at anybody and you know, we're, we're bummed. It didn't work out. We have all kinds of ideas about what we could have done differently and all that, but we all know that's hindsight. We in hindsight, we did the best we could. We had what we had. We were who we were. Yeah, and, um, it, and that's it. Right. And it was stressful, man. I mean, this is stuff that wasn't standards at the time. Like, the how you would transfer cards or like the proper way to even do it. Like I'm repeating what Moon basically tells me. Moon is my my genius guardian angel of all things that I need to absorb. But like, and you should talk to him at some point because he's got a deep rich history in Bitcoin and all this other stuff. But like, yeah, I don't know, man. Like freaking weird uh, across the board, I guess. I don't know what I was going to say. So cool. So we had a lot of good ideas. We had some good projects. Oh yeah, yeah. Good it was stressful. It was stressful. We wanted to be yeah. a startup. Like we, I was just watching Silicon Valley again downstairs. I love that show. Uh, they do make it look so easy though. Like they really like. Oh, we got a million dollar offer for this. We're gonna print our own coin. We're gonna make a million on that. It just it seems so easy. And they have these ideas just like us. They're like, I want to do a new internet. And I'm like, I want to do a new internet. You know, all these things. It's it just doesn't seem so foreign to me. But when you actually try to do it, uh, at least from my experience, it's much harder uh, than it seems on TV. So uh, the project kind of goes into the background. And everyone goes on to their other things, and uh, the web page is still out there. The Vending machines are still out there. And for whatever reason, uh, as things happen, the cards were left in the vending machines. So, Rebecca, at this point, did you hear anything about the project? I mean, we didn't really have a going out of business party, right? Are we talking about uh, just curio cards? Oh, as it, as it, did, what year? Uh, like 2014, um, 2015. Well, uh, certainly at the end of the year, Crypto Kitties comes out smashes yeah. the ethereum network makes it so all these fancy financial transactions can't happen because people are busy trading <laughs> their crypto kitties and i shake my fist at the screen of course i do acknowledge uh, the crypto kitties are different right they're programmatic uh they have a, a hat and one has a cigar one has a hat and a cigar that's really valuable um so well, also, there's a percentage of how many have those assets those attributes of course of course and you got to do that um but they're really successful they get a contract with NBA top shops. They, as far as I know, they do one of our ideas, which is make your own version of Ethereum, Curio Ethereum, and then you own all the Ethereum, you know, power, money, success. Ha ha ha. And uh, I think they did that a couple of times. And even now there's Wax is a copy of EOS and Wax owns all the Wax and they make all the rules and all that kind of thing. Uh, so making a platform has been very successful for a lot of people. Uh, but Curio cards drifts into the background and then, uh, so what happens next from your perspective? How do you start to hear some rumblings about Curio Cards? Obviously, the, the NFT world explodes in like, I don't well, know, 2019, 2020 ish, something like that. Sure. Yeah. I got to give you a big long exposition again. But like basically, uh, shortly after all this Curio stuff and working on a bunch of projects with Moon and we're, like we're doing a whole bunch of stuff with 10 grand, like pushing like collectibles on blockchain. We did a bunch of other stuff on the Ubic because it was cheaper. We weren't going to pay $4 for gas no or 50 cents for gas we were only going to pay a quarter of a penny so we were going to go to this cool fork which i do love the ubic guys they're awesome and they have a super cool vision of like evms in the future but anyway so we're still building a ubic project uh also, but also a, a very nice book by philip k dick <laughs> ubic yeah yeah cool um i mean there's those vibes are all across the entire ecosystem that those guys are super cool um anyway so I, I, you know me, I hop into channels, I collect them, I collect channel, I collect discord channels, I collect different discord, te like teams, groups, whatever, and just kind of like lurk. And then if something is amusing enough, or somebody is super passionate enough about what they're saying, I will drop in and suddenly just say something to derail things, not intentionally, or I will try to participate, but it comes off the wrong way. Uh, Please tell me so, you start drawing them. Do you draw them? <laughs> sometimes there's a few so i'm like the curio old curio discord it was like a weird place there was like weird things and accusations that were happening i totally get why like in hindsight but i was like 
why are things like this here? Who are these people making demands of other people? I've never seen them before. I had no idea that you guys were even like pushing forward with a separate like potential like uh, project. Well, slow, slow down because what is a what is a curio discord? It seems like something happened on Twitter. And well, no, uh, no, as no, far no, as no, 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 you're you're jumping way ahead. We're 2018 here. There was so there was an original yes, discord. There was an original project discord okay. where it was talking about okay. like okay this is just a legacy project if you want to connect and stuff like that it's kind of like a legacy zone but people would hop in and out and ask the status of stuff but like the status of stuff was there's no stuff um so that's like 2018 and then nothing I'm not thinking about curio me and moon are still working on our stuff but this year beginning of the year i get like or maybe like fe end of february i was in this giant texas thing maybe you've heard about it where uh, i didn't have power or heat or energy or something for like a week it's wild but right after that there was email in my inbox for a form on a website that i no longer published that was like hey you got any of those curio cards lying around uh, and i'm like what and they're like are you this address and i didn't respond i was like this is this is somebody trying to like fish me um because i work in this space now technically i work in the broader blockchain space so like people are always trying to get my stuff uh but like then I get another message. I get a message on Twitter that's talk, like a couple of days later that's like, what's going on? So I, I check my server like archive on Discord and I'm like, okay, there's tags in the old disk, the Curio server. And it's like one person had posted like three days prior. There's like a new Curio community Discord that just been formed. And I was like, what? Huh? And so I joined that and then I messaged Kian. I don't know if you know Kian, but we, we were we've been talking a lot in the 10 grand server that this is another project we're doing and i was like this is really funny right like this, why are people in a discord server here i'm trying to like wrap my head around it adam who you mentioned earlier messages me like at the same exact moments like hey you're you realize what's going on here and i'm like no uh i don't and then i yeah basically rallied the banners and then we all ended up in the discord and that's right as they were minting minti or like pushing out their first rapper that was broken the famous legendary broken rapper yes so the locked the locked you get, you get this word that you know there was kind of an nft craze going on and i mean i certainly we talked a little bit about the first mm. nft craze for me which was crypto kitties uh where again I'm, I'm shaking my fist i feel we really had a good idea we were really close on it and and i understand like they take all the vc money and all the air in the room and uh, you know, congrats to them. The right place at the right time is Crypto Kitties. Um, but, you know, it drifts along and then it starts coming back, right? Everyone's printing NFTs again and they've got a new name for them. We called them blockchain collectibles or digital collectibles. But now NFT, which seems like an even harder <laughs> sell, right? It's like, uh, you know, just WMF. And you're like, what does that even mean? And you just don't even know. Uh, but it, it comes back and it comes back with a fire. So, uh, these guys had, um, they'd figured out that the old vending machines were still out there and they'd sent Ethereum to them and they'd gotten back curio cards. And what's shocking to me is they didn't just buy them all for themselves. These guys, for whatever reason, published the plans on the internet. And this allowed at least, you know, 10, 20, a reasonable number of people to get in before somebody just came along yeah. and bought them all, which again, I figured would happen anyway. That always does happen. The way yeah. of the world. The even that someone just somebody with more money comes in and just buys them all. And I'm sure that's what happened to the baseball cards uh, the other day. <laughs> but now, now these cards are in new people's hands. And that, like you're saying, it's only certain numbers of the cards and it's really affected the values and the rarities of the cards in strange ways where uh, the number of cards doesn't matter that much. The artwork on the cards doesn't matter that much, but if they were sold recently, <laughs> it seems to matter quite a lot. Uh, at least to the current valuations. Uh, but yeah, so they, they've got all these cards and now they've spent money on them. What do they want to do? They want to sell them. So as you say, they were rushing to the market. And what happened to that first wrapper? Uh, so I think, you know, like they had been working on this stuff for a few days and there was like a pretty cool little crew of like, I, I don't know, kids or like, I don't know, their kids. They felt uh, like college kids potentially. And they like had rallied together a pretty good community and they were working on their own wrapper. And I think, you know, I think they're probably just more like learning, like as they go kind of stuff, but like it, the contract didn't 
let people unwrap from the wrapped cards. So the cards are still there. And if you are one of these people like Travis, who I love, this is how I, I think I'm, I'm, I think I'm on board with the way Travis talks about this stuff is like you're, the NFT is the history of the entire thing. And so if you can track it back to the origin date, then like it still counts. So I think at some point these locked ones are going to be rediscovered and people are going to like have like a rediscovery because they have curio cards. It's just like somebody super glued them in the, in the sleeve, right? Like that's basically what it is. They just melt at the top of the sleeve, but you still have them. They still show up with the same IPFS. You it, like, there's not more of the ERC-20 version or less of the blocked one. So I think you'll see people come back to it. But I think, you know, people, the, the terminology at the time was ape end. And, you know, I wasn't big into this NFT stuff beforehand. Like, I loved, I loved the concept of what we were doing with Curio and, like, blockchain collectibles. But, like, you know, I have to admit, like, the fees stuff was really daunting to me for a long time. And and that's a big proponent of like, I want blockchain to be available for everybody and accessible. And that's, that's a proponent for it. I, I am fortunate enough to think in ether. So like, if I am doing something I'm like, Oh, shit, that's going to be 0 0.01 ETH. Like that sucks. And I'm, but like, that's not what people are thinking. I'm hearing every day, people are like, I spent $120 in gas. What? Like, that's crazy. But at the same point, I don't know. I just can't. Get, I, I don't know. I don't know what I'm saying. And that's that's why in our original plans, we'd hope that after this first series, uh, maybe we would have the funds and the programmers to do our own version of Ethereum. Because even then, just Rhett and I, you know, two kind of amateur guys looking at this thing, uh, we could see right away there were huge scaling problems and there were huge fee problems. And especially if you're going to do something like Kira cards that were supposed to cost a dollar or five bucks or ten bucks kind of thing. There's no way you could have a twenty dollar gas fee on a five. Yeah, you don't item. want to spend money. I mean, this is a concept I've talked about a few times with some of the people I've met in the, in the past month. It's just like there's really cool stuff you can future proof for, for like a metaverse kind of situation on Ethereum. Like, there's all kinds of cool stuff you could be minting right the second that that work currently like we think of as cosmetics and digital worlds that currently exist, Second Life or whatever. But the financial cost of it, like one, and this isn't a, to bash these other networks, because I think that if there's a use case, there's always a reason to try out another network. But like Te Tezos has this like green NFT thing, and that's cool. Like, cool, you've like lowered the cost of consumption to do like a financial transaction. And that's generally a good thing. But at the same point, like what's the use case outside of buy this NFT? Because if, unless there's like a cross chain bridge for like collectibles or stuff, all the markets and economies and stuff are happening on Ethereum. And so unless you have a use case to drive me to your network, th then it's, it's, it's hard to do that. So like uh, it's been interesting to kind of watch as people are like, okay, well, how do I onboard onto this economy? Like they, obviously everyone, everyone who it wants to make stuff like me, I'm a creator. I would love to just shit post and like mint stuff all day, every day on Ethereum, like this stupid webcomic collection I'm working on. Like it's dumb. I'm not planning on selling any of it. I just want to publish to this platform because it doesn't make sense to do it, but it's still expensive. And, but it, it's where the people are. So there may be a possible fix. It was on Twitter the other day that OpenSea is going to be using Polygon, uh, which used to be called Matic as a background currency and the fees will be lower. Now, I don't know if this just means uh, Polygon will get full someday and the Polygon fees will be too high. Yeah, is that just going to use it as like system. a stepping stone, like layer two where you would settle on Ethereum, but you would just push the like the ownership, I, I don't know, the escrow things to Matic potentially? I, I'm not 100% sure, sure the, the details on it. I was just excited for anything that would get the fees down. I don't I know. Like, I, I easier and cheaper to publish these things. We can print more of them. I so, think that the yeah. fees thing is a good argument to a certain extent, but I think at the at end of the day, like you've got this like pay to play environment where like people are playing in this environment and they're innovating and they're pushing the boundaries. And so while you're waiting for something to like work for you on another platform, if you're not innovating on the platform, I think there's plenty of I think there's plenty of opportunities to innovate on any of these other networks, especially for the low cost. Like if you had something that was amazing and you just put out like the most amazing freaking virtual experience in your whole life, life super cheap, accessible, whatever, but it's on, it's on Polkadot or Solana or whatever, like Stellar or like 
I don't know, even Ripple. <laughs> who, who cares? Like, if it's on some other chain, but it's like awesome and people are drawn to it, it doesn't matter what any of these other these prices are. That's kind of how the things are with Ethereum because everyone's there. There's enough assets. There's enough liquidity. There's enough depth and volume. So it doesn't make sense to play ball and other other ecosystems right now with nfts in my opinion but well, i think there's ways I, to bridge that as you move the, forward i don't know what the market thinks but i've enjoyed using the wax platform it's sure a copy of EOS. uh they have garbage pail kids they have baseball cards uh, i don't know the technical details but it seems like the blocks come fast and i send around my cards quickly i don't seem to notice a great deal of delay or cost uh when sending cards or buying cards uh, so it's been fun for me. I, I think it's difficult to get wax. That's a problem. It's not, they say, put your credit card in, but, uh, those things don't work, uh, at least not in the U S and at least dot, 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 and dot, 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 and all those dots. But, um, they could fix that part. But as a, as a platform, it seems pretty cool. But, uh, after, after they got these, uh, cards and they got the second wrapper, uh, there was something else that happened. Uh, they discovered an error card. Uh, what do you think about card number 17, the UASF fork card in Curio cards? Like, what do you, what, what do I think about like, well, I mean, obviously there was a, I mean, I could tell you from, from my perspective, I mean, at least as I recall, uh, Rhett made an error. Uh, there was something wrong with the contract and he had to do it twice. So there became two of these cards. And in many ways, this is kind of important in the, the history that's about to come up next. Uh, what did you think? Should there be a, a misprint card? Should it be included in the original I mean, it, Curio cards? I think all the arguments that you, you would expect have come up about it already. Like, obviously, there's misprints in a misprint market for any sort of like traditional collectible. But if you start to think about like these kind of like contract mistakes or something else like that, I think it, it, it matters a great deal about intent. Was that was the intent of that contract? meant to be published what was the reason why it was gotten rid of and i feel like uh you, if you start to put value on a misprint on a contract then you start to have people create misprints to have value and i don't know if that's necessarily a healthy way to facilitate a, a collectible market but at the same point i think this is early enough along like Again, like you mentioned earlier, Rhett was like stressed out or whatever. There's a lot to be stressed about because no one's doing ownership like this with, with zero decimal ERC twenties. So like, how do you know they're actually getting transferred? It doesn't. Ether EtherScan doesn't even support it anymore. It used to back in the day, but it doesn't even support it anymore just because it's not doesn't conform to the modern standards for ERC twenty tokens. Even though it's more like an ERC eleven uh, fifty five, like that's essentially what they are as they're you know a limited number of a specific asset and not, you know, a single unique, but it's just wild. Like, yeah, no, no wonder like people got stressed out. So, yeah. So for a misprint here, I think it's, I think there's something unique and I, I, I did grab a couple of misprints. Obviously I didn't know about it at the time. I grabbed a couple from the first community wrapper that came out because that was the first opportunity that I had to get some. So. And I, I think this uh, this battle over the misprint led to the kind of splintering of the community. Uh, as you say, the community made their own wrapper, including the misprint. And then Travis and some of the other parts of the community made a new wrapper uh, that didn't include the misprint. And uh, this kind of fractured the community as there's two discords. Uh, hopefully we can come back together uh, because a little while after that, Saturday Night Live and releases their incredible Eminem parody music video uh, where Pete Davidson raps about NFTs as Eminem. Uh, my favorite parts, he says, uh, prices go up and down, you see. I think that's a part they're going to quote back to us in the future, and I've already called that. But uh, that was Saturday night. Sunday morning, uh, they launched this new official community curio card wrapper. They hook it up with OpenSea. Uh, they get the blue check mark. seemed like really fast. It was great. We were on the front page of OpenSea, one of these new trading communities for these newfangled new NFTs that all the kids are into. And um, and then Curio Cards started selling, and they started having a life of their own. And at least you know, from my perspective as one of the creators, uh, it was everything I wanted to see. People had little forums, and they were like, "I'll trade you this for that, and I'll trade you this for that." And they had OpenSea; they could list them at this price. And if you really wanted to buy one, uh, you could put up an offer for however you thought they're worth. You decided the value. It was very voluntary, and um, a little market developed. And uh, 
some uh, curio cards were traded. So uh, Robeck, <laughs> as, as one of the creators of the cards, uh, what do you think of this? Uh, a little market four years later uh, for our little cards. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think that's pretty cool. I, I mean, I hate to go back in the split. Like, I think that it was a little bit more than just the 17B thing. I don't think that was really ultimately the issue. I think it was more just like a transparency thing. While there was transparency about a, quote, official wrapper being developed, there wasn't transparency about a community one. And I think that for me, that was the biggest personal thing but i'm sure people had other things at the end of the day like i don't hate anybody there's also disagreements about the percentage oh yeah i don't really all that's just all that's just things for artists and if it was fair and that kind of thing all that i I don't care yeah all that shit's by bureaucracy at the end of the day like i think no one had any reason to not do whatever they wanted because that's the nature of the game and they can do whatever they want. And I don't think that's, I don't give a shit. Like if these dudes had been like, Hey, fuck you. We're going to put this thing out. Like I would have been like, go for it. Like freaking do it. But you got these other dudes spending their free time, like trying to support like the addition of everything with the understanding. There's not something, anyway, it doesn't really matter. You can cut all this stuff out. No one told them they could set up the discord or write the Twitter thing and all these things. Yeah, exactly. They could have done all they, they, did all. they decided to do their own thing. They were interested in the project. And again, you know, from a, for me, just as a, you know, far away creator looking at the project, any kind of interest is amazing. Uh, those first guys that write the how to file about how to use the old vending machine, totally. they made this possible. And, you know, we didn't pay them a, a cent. We didn't bribe them. We don't know them. Uh, they sound like great guys to me, but uh, yeah, any, anybody that wants to do this on a project, uh, like you say, you know, with the first round, uh, when you would join us in the forums and we'd chat and you'd put up pictures, totally. people did what they wanted to, to become involved in this project. And even in the modern incarnation, it's the same thing. You volunteered, uh, suddenly you're in charge, you're in the project. That's it. Yeah. I mean, I'm, like, again, I'm, I'm not bashing on anybody here. Like I think that I have my I'm only speaking for me and I can't gauge anybody else's perspectives. I have a weird sense of ethics and loyalty and I like those guys and I think they're, they have a lot of like really cool, unique drive, but I also just, you know, I, we had a separation of like uh, transparency. So uh, to move on to the part that after you cut, so we can do this thing. Um, yeah. I don't know. It was, it was cool playing around with the community. I wasn't trying to set any of the floors or prices. Um, it was never about like making a profit. It was just trying to see like, okay, can we spread the awareness and the like word about these cards? How can we get them in front of people? You know, what is perception for me? Like suddenly I'm a, I'm a dormant account, like three something years dormant. I have cards moving, like people are going to be watching me and they do all the time. So like, I have a responsibility not to do something irresponsible despite everybody telling me to constantly, you know, do something irresponsible. I don't care. At the end of the day, it's not about the, the ETH for me. It's about how I can grow the ecosystem and share the stuff. So, well, and again, back in the day, like you said, we only had ether Delta and it didn't really work. You would try to list a card on there. Maybe you bought a card for a dollar. You want to sell it for $5 and you'd list it and there weren't any buyers and you weren't sure if you were staying online or not, and you weren't sure if you were even gonna get your card back. And so if you were trying to build a set of these cards, like you said, some of these guys came in and bought all the cards and it was hard to get other cards, but maybe you had a bunch of the old ones you wanna trade, uh, that wasn't available to you. But now, thanks to OpenSea, and as well as these forums where a lot of, like you say, honor system trades went on, people were vouched for, and they made trades, even in this modern world where there's all kinds of escrow options, Uh, They made escrow trades and all kinds of things, and I think they worked. And what's great is that people were finally able to complete their sets. Uh, A couple of days after they opened up the market, I saw at least two people. I think one of them was Moon, uh, your friend. It might have been even Kian, the other friend. might have been both of them. But um, two people posted their complete sets to Twitter with screenshots. I think the other one might have been Freddie Garcia or something like that. But uh, it was great. It was a... for me as a, you know, a collector person and then a person trying to become uh, like a collectible card company uh, to see people adopt your idea of, well, they, they numbered the cards, so they're a series. And, you know, if I collect all the numbers, I have all the series. And clearly, you know, I don't think that Curio is going to make any car- more cards right now. It's four years ago and all that. So you can kind of say, well, I probably have the, the complete series. And uh, they did just what I thought they did. They took pictures of it. They posted on Twitter proudly. I retweeted them and favored them and all the things I can do. Um, but uh, it was really cool 
uh, to see them collect them into sets. Uh, what do you yeah, think? Yeah, I mean, I, I wanted to early on, like when the energy was super cool, like do uh, some really cool like treasure hunt kind of style things where you hide different like work records or keys. And I still think I'm going to do that for like a set. Like the set for me, like it, it, it is a cool vehicle to have and I will keep a set to have just to have one. But at the same point, like, I don't know, some weird gamified thing I feel like is really valuable. I think that some of the stuff that happened is kind of discouraging and, 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 but I think as market cycles happen, you know, like even energy that could feel like in a lower market, could potentially influence something to be not as creative. So, uh, yeah, I don't know. I think the full set stuff is really cool. And I really like and appreciate the fact that people are trying to get them and you don't think about at the time, like how limited the actual number of them are. Like there's like what only 108, like 108 or 88 or something like potential uh, complete sets. 111 possible sets based upon the low number of Daniel's cards. Yeah. Uh, and every one of Daniel's cards would have to be allocated to an individual set account or depending how you want to quantify it, if you have multiple sets in one account. But, um, yeah, that's kind of the linchpin right now. Nobody, we didn't even think about it at the time, but yeah, when you go to those really low limits, and I think there's also ways of collecting like artist sets where one to yeah. 10 are a set, certainly, you know, 11 through 14, you know, these kind of, these artist groupings are also a really fun way uh, to micro collect it where maybe it's possible to get a set of these lower ones where the, the other ones are just too expensive and too rare. Um, so yes, it's interesting to me to see if they, if they will all become 111 sets if that's the most valuable configuration of these cards uh but yeah, it, I don't more likely they'll be in individual collectors or individual speculators uh hands yeah i mean i think it's a tough call uh it the, even the ability to get 111 sets out there is pretty impossible uh, uh, the way the current card ac allocation is and to even get them there like there's so many variables our wallets that are dormant now will they remain dormant who knows did somebody die did they lose their keys was it just like a, a fever dream like who knows uh the other question is like for me like people watch me all the time i try not to move stuff because it doesn't make sense to but i also you know i'm trying to have there be enough circulation that people don't feel like they're unattainable but like I'm not trying to manipulate the markets. I'm trying to be transparent in that like for 29s, people can look at the wallet where they are. There's like escrow stuff, like I mean, for when they'll be out. For 26s, there's an original distribution that people set and just came to me with their prices. And then I kind of just was like, okay, well, no more because I don't, I want to see how people start to think about this stuff. If it's a set-based thing, it doesn't matter what the individual cards are, I think, at a certain point. But if people start to do this thing, like you're mentioning, where you're collecting an artist set particular or like themes or things like that, like what are you looking for? Are you looking for like lowest number available? Or are you looking for something that matches your aesthetic? You want to be a baron of these different things when you start to have this discovery and these different markets pop up for reasoning. I think, you know, then you can be like, okay, well, it's a, it's okay. The, the, the easiest thing to do for any of these whales would have been to dump everything, but all that would have done would have been to create new whales that would have been potentially more malicious. And I think one of the biggest reasons I stuck around and like continued to headbutt this community is that even though we're a little quiet right now, there's obviously enough like joint mind share on why this is cool that people aren't coming out of the woodworks to just be like, okay, here's all 170, you know, 29s available. Buy them all at, you know, 0.1 and have fun. Like, goodbye. Like, I, and I think that's, I think that's meaningful long-term. Not for price valuations, but just generally for the future of the, the exhibit. It is interesting to see how the community will form out and if the old wallets will come back online and someday if I'll get to figure out who that whale was that, uh, bought all of your cards before I could get any stuff like that uh, certainly happened several times on the project, but uh, it's interesting to see how it'll turn out. Uh, it's kind of taken on a life of its own. It just goes out there. Now we uh, wait to see if people discover it. Uh, there's been a, a bit of a controversy uh, that mad Bitcoin's character on Twitter has been kicking up some controversy. It seems like uh, uh, Curio cards have been included in the crypto art Wikipedia, which is very cool and I'm very honored to be included in there, but we're not included in the history of NFTs. 
Uh, so I think there might be something where the, the existing projects want to be higher numbers than they are. But I think we all know that the blockchain proves everything. Uh, so do you think this will sort itself out? Will Karyo cards be included in the NFT Wikipedia article? Dude, you know, I don't know. Like, uh, Wikipedia is its own beast. And, like, power to the people who spend their time there building it. It's a valuable resource. But, like, I think it's probably, like, mystical wizards behind closed doors, like, casting spells or some shit. So, like, I don't know, man. Like, who knows? I'm sure at some I, I point somebody will be like, hey, just look at the ledger. And, but, you know. With the mystical wizards, I think I think you're right on. I feel the same. That's our access to the mainstream press as well. Yeah. Where I, I believe, you know, historically we've got everything. We're we're old, we're unique, we're interesting, we're mentioned in the ERC 721 spec, which again, like this Wikipedia article, for a long time, that's good enough for me. It's good enough for me that we made a cool project that helped inspire some other programmers who made the 721 spec. And even if we're just the very smallest of inspiration or any kind of thing, they don't say uh, that they love us or anything, but uh, they mentioned us. And as a scientist, that's that's enough. That's very nice to be included. And uh, just that was enough. But yeah, the whole comeback thing's pretty fun. Uh, we'll see where it's go. But yeah, it seems like we can't get the press unless we sell for a million dollars. And we can't sell for a million dollars unless we get the press. And uh, there's this kind of cycle there. So I, I'm curious to see if we'll find a way to break out of that. Uh, yeah, I mean, I don't know, man. Again, like for me, this whole journey has been really cool because I've had an opportunity to see what is actually happening in the space. It's afforded me the ability to like experiment with things I've missed out on for like three plus years because I've been focused in other areas. And so, I don't know. I mean, I feel like this stuff is the future. I don't think it's necessarily a future just because people are putting artwork on here. I think there's all kinds of applications that expand way beyond just the immediate like short-sightedness of what's happening. But I think you have to have guinea pigs breaking the ground on any new sort of platform. And if the artists are the ones doing it, more power to them. Because long-term, you know, if you don't just squander that like early ground, like if you're one of the first thousand or 2000 people or 500,000 people, it's still not a majority of people. Like, so like if you're here participating in growing communities and shaping what these things are going to end up being, like, I don't know. I think it's impossible to know what's going to happen. I don't think three and a half years ago when I have cards sitting in either Delta and community members are helping me figure out like four years later, how to get them out. Like, I don't think that was an expectation I had at the time. I was like, well, uh, either Delta doesn't work. These cards are worthless potentially because nobody even put any of them up on either Delta. So why not? Well, you, it's because either Delta doesn't work, but you know, at the time it's just like, okay, well, it was fun to be part of this project and I have these cool videos. Well, and even for getting rid of the cards, there was no way to get rid of them. Uh, there was no way to take them off your hands. I mean, you could have tried to lose the keys. Uh, but other than that, you were pretty much stuck with them. Yeah. Uh, so it is nice that they came back and they have some kind of value and you can work with them now. Um, but yes, it's, it's curious to see if we'll take off, if we'll become a big project or if the NFT, uh, Adam, Adam McBride was really excited about everything about Curio Cards, but he also kind of thought, he was like, well, just based on the timing, it might not be this round. No, I don't uh, think it is. You might cycle the whole thing and then next time come back uh, suddenly with a lot of interest in Curio Cards. My goal is to be completely out of Curio by that point because I don't think it's equitable for me to be there. But I think that <laughs> I think that there will be a time where it is brought up in a, in, in a different regard. Like... Uh, I, it, it definitely helped shape how we thought about expanding potential like blockchain capabilities for this stuff we were doing. And we're, I mean, we've not released anything because why would we? Like, we've just been heads down doing stupid stuff for the past few years, mostly Moon. But like, yeah, you guys, you guys broke ground on like, okay, well, how do you transfer these objects to people? And I think that that's valuable and um, people will come back to it. Punks are cool. I mean, and, and I think that punks are also the punks are probably the first ERC twenty seven twenty ones. I think I think Curio is probably the first ERC eleven fifty fives. Even though they're you know the references for seven twenty ones, but Curios are multiple editions or multiples of an edition, right? So I think the difference is that I mean from I don't know if I'm 100% right because I'm just an art idiot, but from like a technical perspective, an 1155 can be underneath its own contract. So you can have multiple under contract where you guys had every single contract. Each card was its own contract that tracked ownership, which is interesting. It, like that's cool too. Like that's like the same functionality, but it doesn't have a overhead collection, right? So 
It was great to talk to Adam. Uh, I did an interview with him not too long ago. And uh, all I these ideas, we were, we were really obscure talking about this stuff back in the day. Suddenly he was all behind. Like I didn't have to do any of my basic NFT, like why it's valuable. He was like, I know why it's valuable. I know why it's a collectible. I like collections, like all the stuff that used to be deal breakers. When I try to talk to people about carry cards, all the new people, all the new NFT people, they just get it by default. Yep. Uh, so I think that's great. And the other thing that's great is uh, when I was messing around with the baseball cards the other day is that uh, the the Wax website uh, pretty much has all the features that I ever wanted. Uh, you can make the cards. The cards are in a series. You can print multiple ones. Uh, Tops has printed gold borders and silver borders and animated borders and all the kind of basic things that I always thought everyone would do. And uh, people were you know, popping them up. They're buying them up. Uh, they're loving it. I mean, I, I hope... I hope they're not all speculators. Uh, there is kind of a little difference I wanted to say about some of the Curio cards where uh, after it sells, uh, the person takes it immediately and sells it on the, and lists it on the market for double. And uh, I love that. I'm optimistic. Mm -hmm. I, I hope that they get their double and it's great for the market and the artists get a cut and everything. Uh, but then there's a second kind of person who buys that card and puts it in their collection and they don't try to sell it. And maybe they're trying to make a set or they're just happy or whatever it is. Uh, but I like that that second person more, the collector person more than the speculator. They're both, they're cool and, and they're part of the project and I'm glad they're here. But uh, what do you think about collectors versus speculators? Uh, I think it depends. I think, it, again, it goes back to transparency and intent. One of the things that has come out of this weird phase of my life with the curious stuff is like, I've experienced, Board, like I've mentioned, I've explored the broader space with NFTs on Ethereum and like outside of it. And so there's a lot of collectors, collector personas, and there's a lot of speculators and there's a lot of artists and there's a lot of boutique agency shops that are specifically targeting like ancient meme people to like get, flip them a quick thing to build a relationship, partnership based relationships. Totally makes sense. Why wouldn't you do that? But at the same point, like uh, it's just like, okay, well, you have to filter through some of this stuff. What's going to be like the long-term value behind a lot of this stuff? So, so if you have a collector who's out there saying like, show me your NFT, like I'm buying an NFT every day, come on. But then they buy an NFT and then they're doing it because it's like free followers or whatever. And then they flip it and they flip it for like very little versus what they paid for it. What they do is they devalue the artist or whoever issued that stuff's work. And so that's that's not a speculator and that's not a collector. That is just, advertising a personal brand i feel like and i feel like that damages all of the ecosystem in a certain way just because it's just meant to build that individual versus other things but i think you know speculators are like yeah fuck i'm buying this this gener generated art collection that some dude spent all this time doing weird crazy wacky stuff because one it's super cool looking but it's also like really unique and speculative and maybe in like six months people are be like dang, I really need this scribble. Like that identifies with me. So I, I don't think that speculators are bad. I think that they are also hold just as long as a collector. I just think that it's about the intent. Like if you're like, yeah, I'm buying your art to buy your art because I love your art, then that's who you should be. If you're like, I'm buying your stuff because I'm going to flip it later on. I, that doesn't hurt anybody either. So that's my, that's my perspective on it. I agree. And I, I don't want to, be down on the speculators either. I just think it's a hilarious behavior uh, when you buy like a comic book in a marketplace and you just slap a new label <laughs> and put it back in the window versus if you buy a comic book in the marketplace and you you read it and you treasure it and you put it in your own collection. It's just a different well, you get why You get why somebody would want it versus just getting it because you assume somebody will want it, right? Like you understand the connection that makes that, that, that connects with a different collector. So when a collector comes to you, you can tell the difference between speculator, like a speculator will be like, hey, I'll give you this for like five or whatever. And you're like, eh, is this worth my ethics? Eh, maybe. And then the collector is like, hey, look, I don't have a lot, but like, here's what I can tell you about this weird random story. And it's like, okay, well, you're full of shit or you're not. And you're probably not because you get one of these weird intricate details you wouldn't know if you didn't actually understand what this piece is. So, yeah. And I also love the idea that there are so many artists in this game now uh, that uh, I've heard of some of my friends doing this where they're trading um, some of their NFTs for somebody else's NFTs 
with some physical pieces or you know some physical pieces with some other nfts from their other friend and all these different kind of cross trades where at the end of the day as an artist i mean if you could just do these trades and then make more art you just end up with a bunch of your friends arts and i think that's a really fun way to to end up with something yeah i think that's been a cool part of this is that i don't know i discovered a lot of these platforms that didn't know existed and how they interconnected and i've made I don't know. I, I, I hope they're friends ish, friendly ish. I've made, I met a lot of people the past couple of months and it's been really cool to kind of like go on this journey with them as they've like published their work and try and explore like, okay, well, how do I make this? Is this long term? Like, how do I make sure I don't get left in the dust if things turn otherwise? Like, what, what sacrifices are it worth? And yeah, it's just friends that you end up, it ends up either starting with friends collecting friends or people becoming friends and then collecting friends. So, I think that's kind of kind of how it goes. Or you have a few pieces that may not be friendly you just send it up with because they sent it to you. So uh, what are you working on right now? And uh, where can people find your work? What are you working on in the future? Uh, so, I mean, mostly what I'm doing is supporting the work Moon is doing. He, for the past few years, has been working on an NFT backend for publishing and minting way before he knew what rareable or open sea or anything is so it's got this like really interesting like way of doing things it's not like gonna it's not groundbreaking but he's been really really focused on it and so we're working on trying to wrap that up and get that out and that's like part of the 10 grand stuff outside of that i don't know i just work in the space and i'm super like blockchain agnostic i think there's a lot of really cool applications for most of them as i've gone on and so uh i just want to grow whatever web3 or like the digital world ends up being down the road because you know i've still got at least 30 years left hope god willing like or universe willing or whatever you want to say to like a lot has happened in the 30 something years i've briefly had i feel like we can get to the hollow deck right like right that's where we're going right i don't know and then i can hang my curio cards on the wall in yeah. my uh, graphic room in the holodeck yeah that's what i want that's all i want i just you know blip over to hang out with my friends feel like i'm there but my curio cards are on the wall ultimately at the end of the day well that sounds great and i i know people can check your work at robex world uh you can search that on google uh do you have a twitter or anything else people should follow you on uh sure yeah uh you can find me on twitter it's robeck underscore world i don't know uh I have to renew the SSL cert on my site. So but that's rwx.jp.net. Way easier. Cool. Very cool. Well, thanks so much for joining us. And I hope we can do another conversation soon if uh, anything happens in Curio Cards. And as well as just to talk about this NFT space and to see where it goes, because it's developing every single oh, yeah, day. I mean, super cool. Launch. Tom Brady wants to do one, the Manning brothers, uh, big companies, big artists, all kinds of things every day. You have never have any idea what's going to happen next. So. Yeah, I, it was a pleasure being on. If you ever have a panel about why brands shouldn't do things the right way or the wrong way, feel free to have me on. It was a pleasure. Uh, thank you for, for, for talking. That sounds great. Thanks so much, Roback, for joining us. Uh, be sure to give us a thumbs up down below and subscribe if you haven't already to the World Crypto Network. Until next time, bye-bye. This episode was sponsored by NFT Ventures Miami. Become an NFTV artist. Sign up today. Easy bit. Easy bit. Easy bit. Bitcoin ATMs. Easy bit.